Hello everyone. Welcome to this Applied Remote Sensing training on Introduction to Lightning Observations and Applications. We will start with part 1 on Background and History of Lightning Measurements. My name is Amita Mehta from RSET and we are fortunate to have Dr. Stephen Goodman, uh, an expert in lightning measurements from NASA and he is going to conduct today's session. We'll start with a brief introduction to Applied Remote Sensing Training Program or RSET, which is a part of NASA Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. RSET provides accessible, relevant and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods and tools and the thematic area for training covered by RSET are shown here. Uh, trainings include a variety of applications of satellite data for decision making and they are tailored to audience with a variety of experience levels from introductory to advanced. RSET trainings are mostly online but there are also in-person trainings. Uh, there are live and instructor-led trainings or there are also asynchronous and self-paced trainings available from RSET website. As I mentioned, they are cost-free, uh, they are bilingual in the sense that many are offered in English and Spanish, and most trainings, um, training material is available in Spanish. It's translated and available. Um, there are also trainings available in French. Um, we use only open source software and data and accommodate a variety of levels of expertise. We will start today's session with a background about lightning. Lightning is high current electrical discharge between positively and negatively charged regions of a thunderstorm as shown here in this figure. When storm clouds grow vertically, ice particles form within those clouds. Uh, these particles collide, uh, they break apart into a variety of sized particles. So smaller particles acquire positive charge and larger particles usually acquire a negative charge. Um, under the influence of gravity and updrafts within the clouds, these particles are separated and they uh, create these charged uh, layers and they uh, build electrical potential. Uh, this electrical potential is built within clouds, um, between clouds and also between cloud and, and ground as shown here. When this, um, because of this potential electrical discharge occurs, that's when the lightning flash occurs. Now cloud to ground lightning uh, makes uh, just about 20% of total lightning. Most or majority of the lightning that we see is intracloud lightning. Lightning heats up air up to 30,000 degrees Celsius, which is so much hotter than even the surface of the sun. And because of these warm temperatures, the air nearby um, is, is heated and uh, it expands so explosively, uh, producing booming sound wave that we call thunder. Now thunder or sound wave that travels at 330 meters per second, whereas light that travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. So for thunder to travel uh, one mile of distance, it takes five seconds, whereas lightning flash uh, travels that distance in five microseconds. And so it's our experience that we see um, lightning flash first and then a few seconds later we hear uh, thundering sound. So why even study lightning or measure lightning? So according to one of the studies from NIH, um, it uh, shows that thousands of fatalities occur uh, worldwide during, because of the lightning strike and 10 times more injuries occur. More than 70% of lightning strike survivors, they suffer from health impacts and permanent disabilities. Lightning is responsible for igniting wildfires. Uh, many of the wildfires is are because of uh, lightning strike. Lightning strikes on power lines and electrical poles result in power outages. Lightning strikes generate an electromagnetic pulse that creates a high voltage uh, power surge and that can damage electronics and electrical equipment on ground. Um, also, uh, as shown in this paper, it is predicted that over the US, a warming climate is likely to increase lightning strikes. For every one degree Celsius of warming, lightning strikes will go up by about 
12%. So it's important to measure lightning and understand um, uh, just so that we can um, have be warned about these hazards. So with that, uh, overall training learning objectives are given here. By the end of this training, you'll be able to identify common lightning causes, patterns and potential for causing damage, identify how space and ground-based lightning observations are used to monitor lightning frequency and intensity, and identify resources for accessing lightning data products. There's a prerequisite, Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, that provides information about satellite and some of the jargons you will hear uh, during this webinar. There will be three uh, webinar sessions, including today's. Uh, today's session will be on background and history of lightning measurements. Um, also, there's a note about homework here. Uh, there will be one homework that will be posted on April 2nd on our training web page and the homework will be due on April 17th. Uh, again, it will be via Google form, uh, which will be available on our web page. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Notice that um, after today's session, next session is going to be uh, on Thursday day after tomorrow and next Tuesday is the last session. A note about how to ask questions. Uh, so please put your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go and we will try to get to all of the questions during the question and answer session after the webinar. The remainder of the questions that we cannot address during that time will be answered in the question and answer document, which will be posted on the training website about a week after the training. That brings us to our trainers today. Um, we have our guest speaker, Dr. Stephen Goodman. Uh, I will introduce him in a few seconds, but I also want to acknowledge our uh, guest contributor, Dr. Christopher Schulz. Uh, from NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, Dr. Schulz helped us in coordinating uh, this training, all three sessions. So really thank you, uh, Dr. Schulz. Dr. Schulz is a research meteorologist in the Earth Science Branch at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Dr. Schulz's research centers on understanding how clouds electrify to produce lightning and how light lightning can be used diagnose hazardous weather and other phenomena like wildfires and volcanic eruptions. Dr. Schulz spends part of his time working with decision makers to integrate lightning data sets into operational frameworks to improve real-time decision making through NASA's short-term prediction and research uh, transition center sport. So next we invite our speaker for today Dr. Goodman. Dr. Goodman is a Senior Program Advisor to NOAA and NASA for the Next Generation Geostationary and Extended Observations or GEOXO program, follow on to the GOES Weather Satellite Series. He is also an Affiliated Professor of Atmospheric Science at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. He has authored more than 80 peer-reviewed papers and books on high-impact weather, lightning, precipitation, and climate variability and change during his more than 40-year career with NASA and NOAA. Dr. Goodman retired in December 2017 from NOAA as a senior scientist and member of the NOAA Council of Fellows. His involvement with the programmatic aspects of climate science began during a stint at NASA headquarters in 2003 as a program executive supporting the interagency team that developed the first 10-year plan for the United States Group on Earth Observations, or USGO. USGO is a subcommittee under the White House National Science and Technology Council's Committee on the Environment. Dr. Goodman previously served as the chief scientist for NOAA's Geostationary Operational Environment Satellite, GOES-R program, as a member of the NOAA and NASA space-based GEO and LEO Lightning Mapper Instrument Team and Chair of the WMO GCOS Task Team on Lightning Observations and Climate Applications. So here, uh, Dr. 
Stephen Kutner. So uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, background and history of lightning measurements and how we got to where we are today and some of the most current uh, research we're doing related to uh, climate variability and change, which I don't think the other speakers will be talking <clears throat> about. All right, history of lightning measurements. Let's get started. So the objectives of this uh, lesson will be um, uh, introducing you to weather impacts so that you understand the societal benefits of observing lightning, like why do we want to look at lightning? And in particular, why do we want to do it from space? I'll talk about the early history of lightning observations going back to the 1960s, <clears throat> um, how we observe lightning from space. There are a number of challenges in being able to make this measurement. And then lastly, lightning climate variability and change. So some of the weather impacts on lightning are shown here in the graphic. Uh, lightning by itself, of course, is a public <clears throat> uh, safety issue. People being out golfing or outdoors working or at festivals, lightning's a hazard in itself, but lightning's associated with hurricanes, tornadic storms, uh, floods, a particular issue in the inner mountain west of the US where uh, the radars, which are used for storm uh, monitoring and and precipitation measuring, are being blocked by the high terrain of the mountains, and so lightning uh, can fill those gaps. Um, forest fires, uh, lightning is certainly the most common natural source of fires, uh, maybe second to human-induced fires. Uh, volcanic eruptions have lightning, and uh, winter storms especially when they have high moisture content, um, produce uh, lightning. Sometimes dozens of flashes can occur from a snowstorm as it passes. So improved forecaster situational awareness by observing the lightning, and it provides information on the trends of intensifying storms, which is very useful to forecasters. Um, for aviation and marine warnings, when you get outside, the continental US, we have a sparse network of coverage from the radars and uh, the lightning provides additional insight into the development of uh, thunderstorms, especially those of concern producing convective turbulence as the storm is growing uh, vertically and then make some lightning and you don't have good radars on the airplanes, it gives you some information out ahead. Um, I mentioned tropical cyclone intensity change. Rapid intensification is of particular interest when a uh, developing tropical uh, cyclone into a hurricane uh, pressure drops very rapidly and within 24 hours, um, what intensity will the storm be? And lightning is providing some insight into that that could be useful. And then lastly, this, this decadal changes of extreme weather. Um, what does lightning tell us about that? And one of the advantages of, of lightning is we have low data latency. You know, radar takes, depending on what country you're in, five to 10 minutes to scan the volume of a cloud, whereas lightning is telling you instantaneously, hey, I've got lightning, I got a thunderstorm, there's more lightning in five minutes, and yeah, it's intensifying. And so it does provide that unique measurement. So I wanted you to understand that there's two major types of lightning. Called, we call that total lightning. So you have lightning in the cloud. At the left, you can see lightning in the cloud and also a cloud to ground strike. Uh, notice the dendritic nature of the flash. It's trying to tap into space charge below the cloud. And at one point, it makes a connection to the Earth. And it's very bright when uh, the, the lightning makes contact there. And then on the right, you see actually a double uh, stroke discharge uh, from the cloud to the ground. Um, the lightning mappers in space that we have can see the lightning that's up in the cloud, but it doesn't see this cloud to ground lightning channel. That's that's best detected by ground-based radio frequency networks that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. So let's look at the anatomy of a lightning discharge. So as the storm develops, we get uh, the ground is indicated by the uh, slanted dashed lines in these panels A through F. So we begin in A with a, what we call an air mass or single cell pulse type thunderstorm. 
the uh, small ice particles uh, collide and rebound from larger hail particles. The hail particles settle down with the updraft in the middle part of the cloud there shown by the minus sign. That's a negatively charged uh, area of the cloud. And then aloft, the small particles will acquire a net positive charge. And so you have this dipole created positive above, negative in the middle, and that reaches breakdown potential at some point, and then you get the lightning charge discharge uh, to neutralize that stress. And then down in the right side, as we get precipitation falling out of the cloud, it's carrying a positive, net positive charge, and you get a, a negative middle and positive lower part of the cloud, and that dipole then allows the uh, the lightning streamers, as we call them, to propagate and eventually reach the ground, and we call that the cloud to ground stroke, cloud to ground flash. And then in the middle panel there, and see, you see we've got vertical motions, and we got positive charges aloft, negative charges in the middle, and we can have interaction even between those two cells. And in D, you see a horizontally propagating lightning discharge, which eventually reaches a point where it finds a path to ground, as in D. And as the storm keeps growing, maturing, and what we call growing upscale, um, you see the lightning can go from vertical out into the storm anvil, as we call it, to the upper left there in E, and also can go out um, to the right in E into what would eventually become a trailing uh, stratiform or light rain region behind the leading line of uh, convective storm. So that's the life cycle of the lightning in a nutshell. And as it continues to grow up scale, what I just showed you would be the front part on the right of this schematic, which is we have mature updrafts and thunderstorms on the right, and then we get the uh, ventilation of the, the lightning aloft, lightning crystal, uh, the crystals and, and uh, even small hail cloud particles will be vented to the left there, as you see. And then we get a weak but persistent, what we call mesoscale updraft, which can span over a couple hundred kilometers. And the uh, blue lightning flash you saw in the beginning, this very long flash, this is what causes it. It's, it's the ventilation of those particles that are charged out to the stratiform rain region, so the lightning occurs in the front leading edge of the storms, and then it can propagate backwards. And that becomes a very serious public safety issue because you may think that the storm has passed you by and there's this thing called the 30-30 rule. If you go 30 minutes and haven't heard thunder, you know, it's okay to go outside. But this, this changes the equation because now the storm may have moved many tens of kilometers away from your position. And then if you've got this uh, cloud behind it, it can be charged, it can produce lightning, and in some cases, I believe the example you see at the beginning there produced, uh, I think it was 88 cloud to ground discharges as one single discharge propagated from the front to the rear of the cloud, lasting 10, 15 seconds in time. And so you're not really prepared for that, and I think that's still a challenge going forward with our operational measurements. How, how do you best alert, say, workers on an airport tarmac who are handling baggage or refueling, or just people out outside doing their work. I think the coast is clear, but it's not. But these flashes are not that frequent, and you don't want to overwarn, especially at an airport, because you can't ground the airplanes. But people need to be aware of that and take appropriate precautions. So I want to talk about the lifetime of an individual thunderstorm, which is typically an hour or less. This is a lot of the motivation for why we develop lightning mappers to observe lightning from space. So here's an example of a well-studied, maybe one of the best studied storms of all time, called the Monrovia microburst that happened in the Huntsville, Alabama area, 20 July, 1986. And we had a number of research radars and other uh, equipment out to measure different aspects of the storm. We call this a pulse air mass storm. Um, it had 65 uh, dBZ, Z being reflectivity uh, peak, and what dBZ is is a, a measure of the particle size and con concentration in the cloud. So aloft in the storm, if that number is bigger, then the storm is more intense, better developed, 
These storms can go up to 18, 20 kilometers in altitude. This storm produced pea sized hail, a 40 knot uh, outflow, uh, which is a problem certainly for landing airplanes with wind shear. And what we uh, discovered here, which wasn't that well known, it produced 110 photo lightning uh, discharges of which only six were cloud to ground strikes. And for this reason, we want to monitor the total lightning, that is the in cloud and cloud to ground lightning, both to understand how the storm is intensifying and the, related to the kinematics and dynamics of a thunderstorm. You can't just measure the cloud to ground strike. Certainly that's a public safety hazard. It starts fires, but in terms of the the evolution of a thunderstorm and its potential severity, total lightning is what we need to observe. And this example from 1986, these are our old versions of geostationary satellites, five channel imager. And we only updated imagery uh, in 15 to 30 minutes from those satellites. And as I've already alluded to, you only get two or three observations over the whole lifetime of that storm. Nowadays, we can do rapid scanning and do minute by minute scans from our newest generation uh, imagers. So that problem has been uh, mitigated. But back then, this is the update frequency we get. And I'm showing you on the bottom left there is the cloud top is cooling and getting brighter. Uh, you can see what the internal structure of the storm is from uh, radar. And look at 1907 to 1916, we're talking less than 10 minutes. And what we have is developing uh, precipitation and, and hail aloft in the storm at 1911. And then at 1913, two minutes later, it's already descending towards the earth and even more so at 1916. This is what produces the microbursts, the descending precipitation shaft and outflow. And so you've missed all that. That's all occurring between uh, what, 1900 and 1930, and you really can't do any diagnostic on trends. So this was big motivation for why we wanted lightning measurements. So again, I'm gonna walk you through how lightning's related to the storm growth and decay. So here I'm showing you a parameter called differential reflectivity or ZDR. And when that becomes negative, that parameter, the water drops aloft are freezing. So instead of being oblate shapes, they tend to be more rounded and it changes this differential reflectivity between horizontal and vertical pulses of the radar. And the thing to note here is in the top panel, we get glaciation of the storm. That means ice crystals at the top of the cloud within six minutes of that first frame. And you're already developing a big hail core and the uh, precipitation hail core is already descending within six minutes of that. And then uh, the raindrops shown here at the bottom in the left panel um, with the growth of the uh, hydrometeors or hydrometeors is shorthand for what you see there, hail, snow, grapple, uh, and the rain raindrops that are in the cloud. But notice how the core fills up and then it descends. And that's preceding the, uh, the outflow that I, that I spoke to. Uh, dual polarization, Doppler weather radars that measure inbound and outbound velocity to the radar and also the precipitation characteristics is the latest operational radar we have across the country. And then lastly, uh, connecting the whole story here, these are lightning measurements that were taken from a, a chase fan uh, with electrical uh, instrumentation on board. This is how we determined there were 110 in cloud and six cloud to ground flashes. If you look at the green bars, you see how the lightning is rapidly increasing and the cloud to ground lightning is on the order of uh, one or even less than one flash per minute between about 1912 and 1922 here. And you see the updraft goes up um, and then the microburst begins and you have hail at the ground and the microburst outflow occurs. And if you compare that to the upper right where we've got the vertical uh, profile of the radar reflectivity or precipitation structure, you'll see as the storm's growing vertically, um, the radar reflectivity is indicating growth to the storm top here. And you'll note that if you're a satellite and you're looking at this from above, you don't see much change in the cloud top structure, even though internally to the storm, this precipitation core is descending before the um, velocity delta V 
inbound and outbound radial velocity that's detected becomes much stronger. So you miss all that from the satellite, and that's, of course, why radars are still useful. And then on the bottom, we have vertical velocity, and you can see how the vertical velocity is increasing as the cloud top is growing, and then it decreases with time. And you'll note that around the time of maximum peak vertical velocity, we get the peak in the total lightning. So that's how the lightning, especially total lightning, is connected to the growth and decay and development and demise of your typical thunderstorm. And then if we take that to the extreme, here's a tornadic storm that we observed. And if you look at the cloud to ground lightning time series relative to time zero, which is when the tornado occurs, what you see is it's quite flat, but this trend with the updraft growth prior to the tornado, we see a, a large increase in the total lightning that is in cloud dominated uh, plus the cloud to ground, which is not very many. And the forecasters now use this, what we call lightning jump, as a, an early indicator of a sea, in a sea of developing storms. Which one do I need to pay closest attention to? Which one might produce severe weather? This is your best indicator here. And we can observe these from space, these changes in total lightning. And then here on the upper right, we're showing you modest lightning. And then I call it a lightning surge, but it's this lightning jump or lightning tendency that's, that's happening here with a major increase. So the forecaster looks for that information and that was in 10 minutes. And then here at the early time, there's lightning, but the velocity couplet seen by the radar is weak. And so a forecaster would not put out a warning based on that, but now it's much stronger. This red versus the green, um, almost gate to gate shear is very indicative of rotation in the storm. And note on the bottom here, the national average for tornado uh, warning lead time after decades, is, even with Doppler dual polarization radar, is still on average 14 minutes. And where the lightning data is most useful is not the giant um, level four, level five uh, supercell storms that make giant tornadoes. It's the weaker ones um, that still cause damage, can still uh, cause casualties. Um, where these uh, rotational couplets are not very clear. And so the lightning's an added indicator, coupled with the radar and other information that the forecaster has. Ah, yeah, I need to put out a warning on this potentially severe storm. So let's go to the lightning detection systems. I mentioned we're detecting cloud to ground and in cloud lightning. Uh, the longest uh, uh, method we've had was just thunder heard by human observer. Um, the human observer can hear thunder out to about 15 kilometers, and these data were recorded at, at weather service observing stations around the world. And you go back to 1953, uh, the World Meteorological Organization made their first climatological map based on, on thunder heard, or we call thunder day. Um, then we start having remote sensing techniques such as local electric field mill networks, which can observe the developing electric field above a particular point. And as it becomes more negative, then uh, the charge is building up and then an incipient lightning flash is expected within maybe tens of minutes. We also have high-speed digital video cameras. We started out with just regular film, um, but now we have these very high-speed um, cameras running from say 7,000 frames per second to a million frames per second that give us greater detail on what lightning uh, looks like. Uh, and then we have different frequencies that are used from very low frequency to very high frequency radio uh, detection systems, usually a network of receivers. Um, in the short range, the VHF can see the small intercloud lightnings. Um, we have a national cloud to ground lightning network as do a number of countries that operate at low frequency, about 500 kilohertz where the, that strike to the ground I showed you uh, radiates radio energy uh, in all directions and they can pick that up. If you have a network of receivers, the, the, uh, that, that uh, lightning pulse or that radio noise reaches receivers at different times and then they can back, backtrack uh, the time of arrival as we call it to locate that lightning in, in uh, three dimensional space. Um, we have long range networks at very low frequency and those work by having the lightning 
uh, spheric or radial signal propagate off the ionosphere, which you see in the in this top panel here, this ELF, they could be one or two skips off the ionosphere. And again, looking at the time of arrival of these waves, you're able to uh, locate, not as accurately as these shorter range systems, however, and they're planes, balloons, um, unmanned aerial <clears throat> vehicles that can also observe lightning, electric fields. And, and then uh, we finally got to space with our optical imagers uh, in both geostationary and low Earth orbit. Um, the reason we use optical is because there's a phenomenon of the ionosphere called the iris effect. And you'll see on my slide of the previous measurements, the problem with that is we wanted to locate and detect lightning on an individual storm basis, then radio signals from space don't do well because there's dispersion as that radio signal hits the ionosphere. And so you can't have high accuracy knowing which storm produced that signal. So key performance measures of these systems, we want high detection efficiency. Not any system is 100% effective for detecting all lightning, small, large, long, short, and so on. We want high location accuracy. We want to know flash type. Was it in cloud or cloud to ground because of the public safety and, and fire threat and storm intensity? We want to know which type if we can. Uh, I can say now that using machine learning, we're just starting to get some progress in identifying the type of lightning from space. That still has more research needed, but we're making headway. You want a stable measurement that's not changing with time and you want all these systems to be consistent. And that's something that we're working for. Um, so one of these high speed video uh, images, we have a video of this. Um, you can see the lightning channel strikes the ground, but at the same time, it's going horizontally. This is again at 7,500 frames per second. And then you see on the right there, this part of a lightning channel that just ends uh, in clear and not clear air, but in cloudy air, but it's just ending. It doesn't go anywhere. And that's because we have space charge from all these particles interacting all over the place. And there'll be a preferred place where the lightning channel can continue to propagate this, what I call streamer, and it'll make its way down to the ground. And what we see from space is not this bottom channel or any of this here, the channel extends up into the cloud and it's the photons from that light that scatter, uh, eventually reaching the top of the cloud, and that's what we detect from space. So as we were developing this lightning uh, mapping system, um, we looked at the history. So we have quite a long history, actually, of optical and radio frequency RF measurements. Uh, but these, none of these satellites were particularly designed to see lightning except for the space shuttle uh, measurement 1981 to 1983. Um, I was there on the second shuttle flight. We had this experiment called the nighttime daytime optical survey of lightning nozzle. And that was a photo cell uh, plus a camera. And then we had a subsequent version called the mesoscale lightning experiment on the shuttle in 1988. And that was also uh, uh, camera system, but in the payload bay. In 1981, it was uh, the cameras operated by astronauts. And astronauts had long uh, reported seeing lightning from space and even long uh, length discharges, like you saw at the beginning. Um, so these uh, op early optical measurements, typically uh, photodiodes and photometers um, on uh, the Vela 5 satellite, which was designed for nuclear monitoring. Um, also detected lightning as a background signal. The Defense Meteorological Satellite Program um, had a number of measurements. Now, any of these are very brief measurements. You've got systems on low Earth orbit that just make a snapshot of the cloud. So you can't monitor the time history of lightning, which as I showed you early on was our goal here for the uh, geostationary satellites that follow. Um, the uh, Earth observing system that NASA had on the tropical rainfall measuring mission, we flew our first uh, lightning mapper in low Earth orbit in 1997. Uh, we used uh, CCD array, charge coupled device array technology for the focal plane. Um, that's what you had on cameras back then. Now most cameras have CMOS uh, detectors, which are lower power. 
um, detectors, and that will be the, the focal plane for our next generation. And then we had the Ghost Next Lightning Mapper. So in 1997, uh, NASA and NOAA had what they called the Advanced Geosynchronous Studies, and we're looking at what might we fly on our next generation of geostationary satellites, which now is called the GOES-R series. And uh, I already told you why we eliminated RF method. So looking at an optical method, um, the challenge then is, well, how do we see like the whole United States? So we have a GOES East and a GOES West satellite at uh, 97 degrees longitude, 137 degrees longitude. You combine them together and you cover the United States and also the adjacent oceans and Gulf of Mexico. Um, and that that's the way you had to observe like the time evolution of a thunderstorm was to be in geostation or orbit because otherwise you get just a snapshot and I'll show you an example of that. And these advanced geosynchronous studies, the lightning mapper was one of six instruments being considered. They were also looking at a geostationary microwave sounder, a geostationary infrared sounder, and uh, a compact coronagraph to look at the sun. So we made measurements from the NASA U2 early on, and then later the Earth Resources 2, or ER2's high altitude airplane gets up to 65,000 feet. So simulating what a satellite would see, we could get up above the cloud and observe the lightning at cloud top. And noting here in the text that early U2 pilots and astronauts had all observed uh, lightning from space. So let's look at what does lightning from space look like and then how do we turn that into an instrument? So here, uh, here we go. So here's the, the shuttle or space station, both would fly this way around the earth and you see you only get a snapshot of that light that's at the top of the cloud. So the lightning is occurring in the cloud and the photons from that lightning channel eventually make their way to the top and illuminate the cloud top. Sometimes they're small storms, sometimes they're, they're bigger storms, um, but you see how short lived that is. And, you know, the challenge then, how do we see not at nighttime like this, but daytime? So daytime was our biggest challenge for building an instrument to see lightning. And uh, at NASA, we build these science traceability matrices for all instruments. And so, we identify what are the science objectives. So here on the left, we have validation, global water and energy change, uh, diagnostics, a like GWEC um, shown here, prognostics, uh, natural hazards, um, the lightning hazard itself and severe weather, which was the big, the big dog in all this. When we were considering the next generation instruments, the director of the, of the Weather Service Storm Prediction Center was a huge advocate for the lightning mapper and another large advocate was um, the en route air traffic uh, system from the FAA because they don't have good radars on their airplanes they are typically X-band, which give you only short range of detection and you're far from the coast, so you don't have the ground-based uh, radar coverage. So the lightning mapper data was viewed as something you could upload to a cockpit and the pilot would then have a good awareness of the storms around them and where they were heading. And at that time, there was talk of, of an air traffic system where instead of relying on dispatchers on the ground, that there'd be more uh, decision making in the cockpit. So getting the data to the pilot and they could decide if they needed to revector around certain storms. All that was, was building uh, advocacy for why we should have a lightning mapper which measured something we didn't measure otherwise. If you look at the requirements here, total lightning, uniform detection, stationary detection, uh, sorry, stationary detection efficiency, that's uh, temporally, so being in geo. Uh, one of the questions we asked the users, the National Weather Service, was what if we put a lightning mapper with a gimbal on a satellite so that we could just point to where the severe weather was? And they said that won't work for us because we have to give equal service across the country. So from the East Coast, the West Coast, everybody's got to be covered. So you couldn't have a pointing system. You had to have a big enough area coverage so that everybody would see the lightning. The rapid update sampling, I showed you and how that trend of the total lightning uh, goes up so quickly. You want rapid update. 
Um, large area coverage, again, coast to coast in the oceans, but we also want storm scale resolution. So we needed a big focal plane um, detector to see, to see all that. High signal to noise ratio, low false alarm rate, and so forth. And so you can see how that translates into instrument, instrument uh, requirements. And just to give you a little more on the history, our first instrument at NASA was designed for the GOES-M, which is GOES-13 satellite, which has come and gone. And it was to be an instrument of opportunity in a sense to do a demonstration on orbit. But the imager mass had grown to the point where they couldn't accommodate another instrument. So what we did is we took that instrument idea and we reproposed it to NASA for the Earth observing system to fly on the space station and also in uh, low Earth orbit. And I'll show you what, what then came from that. So here's your puddle of light at cloud top um, or pool of light. And it's like a light bulb going off inside the cloud and reaching the cloud top. Um, but again, the daytime challenge was you've got a very bright lit sun cloud top background and the lightning is just a small change of light output relative to that. So here's how we do it. We try and maximize or optimize the pixel size to the pool of lightning at cloud top, which is on the order of four, four to eight kilometers. So we had eight kilometers at Nader um, from geostationary orbit and four kilometers from our low Earth orbiting instruments because that just changed with the altitude of the satellite. And so we optimized the fully filling the pixel with energy from the lightning. Um, spectrally, there are certain spectral lines from lightning, in particular 777 nanometers has um, three spectral emission lines within a couple of nanometers. You get a triplet there from singly, singly ionized oxygen. And of course, the atmosphere is mostly oxygen and nitrogen. So the next biggest line uh, that we would see would be a nitrogen uh, line at uh, uh, 8,700 uh, nanometers. And if you look at the bottom plot here, here's the sun peaking at 600 or 6, 600 nanometers, 6,000 angstrom. But we wanted it to look at lightning, not at where the lightning's, the sun's at a peak, but coming down the curve where it's not as bright. And so here's this region, sweet, sweet spot at about 7,700 nanometers that uh, we wanted to look at that optimizes uh, the view of the lightning spectral signature. We've already got a spatial signature or is filtering. And then um, temporally, we want to sample fast. And why do we do that? The lightning pulse um, is typically a millisecond or so long with a full width half maximum of about 400 microseconds. So when you're not observing within this, within this pulse, you're integrating light from the background and that's just noise. So at the time we developed this, which is 20, 30 years ago, um, we didn't have the fast enough electronics then. We didn't have graphical processing units like NVIDIA or any of that. And we could sample super fast across a large area. So we uh, decided on two milliseconds um, to be able to sample the entire uh, space. We have 128 by 128 pixels we're sampling every two milliseconds, which is quite fast. So while we don't have broad spectral coverage, we have very fast temporal coverage. And then we still have a lot of background signal, even after we do all that filtering. Excuse me. And so what we do is we do background averaging of that cloud top and we can set how many background pixels we, we average over. And then when you get this blip of light above that background and subtract the average background, what you're left with is the lightning pixel. So these are light, uh, pixels having lightning in them, and that's how we detect it during the daytime. Which, of course, nighttime is no challenge. Uh, the technical challenge was the daytime, and that was one of the innovations for this instrument. So we started out going to geo, and then we repurposed the uh, the concept for going to low Earth orbit. Um, the lightning imaging sensor on trim on the right was operational actually from uh, 19. 98, actually we launched in November 1997 around Thanksgiving, going to April of uh, 2015. That gives us our longest climatological data set. 
But prior to that, NASA administrator Dan Golden wanted to do what he called faster, cheaper, better instruments. Why does it take so long to get a new measurement up in orbit? Well, it takes a long time, as you're seeing here. And uh, we we took our engineering uh, flight model. We uh, we made it uh, qualified for space, and we called that the optical transient detector. But it's not only the same instrument as the lightning imaging sensor on trim. And that lasted for five years. Um, we did have issues with the South Atlantic anomaly around Brazil, which is a high radiation region. And one of the reasons we didn't uh, do a better job there is that when we designed the instrument for geostation or orbit, you don't have that problem. Um, had we uh, included thicker aluminum around the telescope for more shielding, then that problem would have been diminished some. But remember, these are the very first instruments of their kind trying to observe lightning from space. You'll see here the optical transient detector was at uh, about 700 kilometers altitude, and we would resample the diurnal cycle, that is the day-night change of uh, thunderstorms over 55 days, and then in trim, which was an altitude of 350 kilometers, but boosted the 400 kilometers in 2001 to extend its life, so it didn't fall out of the sky, um, was about 49 days. And the optical transient detector had a bit larger field of view, as you can see, see here on the plot uh, versus the trim. And then here are some results from those early measurements of the OTD and the LIS combined. So remember, the, the OTD goes to 70 degrees latitude, the trim only goes to 38 degrees latitude, so it's combining this five and 15 year data set, but um, you don't see much difference now, at least on an annual basis. Most of the lightning is over land. We see the Himalaya uh, mountains where you've got air ascending up the mountains and making thunderstorms. Um, the hot spots or chimneys of the world are Asia, Africa, and the Americas. So North American spring, summer, and South America in their spring, summer, which is our winter. You see the, uh, the Sierra Madre in Mexico, Cuba is lit up in Africa. You see Madagascar, which is very mountainous in South Africa here along the coast. Also uh, mountainous have lots of thunderstorms here in Central Africa is the hot spot of Africa. And then the hot spot in the Americas is Lake Maracaibo here in Venezuela. And here's a here's a zoom in on Venezuela. So not only do we have the most thunderstorms on Earth here, about 330 days of the year they have thunderstorms, and that's because you've got Lake Maracaibo up here in northern Venezuela, which is surrounded by mountains, and so you get a land uh, and sea breeze or lake breeze, you know, day and night. So you get a uh, convergence of the air. The air converges, it can go down, but it can only go down to the water, it has to go up. And so that's why we get thunderstorms. And the other interesting thing is we get a lot of the thunderstorms at nighttime. And uh, this is from 1800 to five local standard time. And the mariners would use that as a natural uh, lighthouse. They called it the lighthouse of the Catatumbo. And what the Catatumbo is, that's a river draining from the mountains in the west here into Lake Maracaibo. And so it's that convergent region that lights up at night and the mariners would be able to find their way into the port. And then there's a follow on. So we had the optical transient detector, which was an engineering flight model of the lightning imaging sensor. Then we had the lightning imaging sensor, which was the principal earth observing uh, sensor system instrument, and then we had a flight spare, and it turned out we were able to get back on the International Space Station in, 19, in 2017, and what was good about that, aside from continuing the climate record, is that we were able to get to higher latitudes, so for, for the space station, you get to about 54 degrees latitude, and in the um, um, the trim mission, we only got to 38 degrees uh, latitude in the tropics and then geostationary orbit. Uh, we also currently get to about 54 degrees, but I'll show you the next generation uh, planned coverage, which will get us up to Alaska. Uh, notice here the ISS uh, lightning imager uh, between the red lines, 
uh, their cash lines here and here versus the Liz on trim, which is the colored in part of the plot, gives us about 81% coverage of all the lightning and, and the earth where there is lightning, the big boost of coverage. And we still don't cover the poles even with today's instruments, not optically, but the RF systems do, and I'll talk about that at the end. So here's what the geostationary lightning mapper looks like. Um, here's the satellite on the left. Uh, this is the solar wing attached to the solar wing here are instruments that follow the solar panel and the sun, and these are observing uh, the sun. We have a solar UV imager on here and, uh, and an integrating um, detector of uh, radiation called EXIS. We also um, have space weather instruments that measure particles and protons and neutrons on the satellite. And then here is the imager, the advanced baseline imager uh, called ABI. And then here is the um, uh, lightning, image, uh, lightning uh, sensor called GLM, also looking at Earth. And this is what a pool of light looks like at cloud top. These are the cloud top turrets extending up into the tropopause that you see. So this is what we're detecting. Again, here's another picture of the instrument. There's a person, you can sort of get a sense of the size. This is the, uh, the shroud uh, to block uh, stray light coming into the instrument. And then here it is on the satellite. There's the GLM ABI. This is the field of view of the GLM. So from goes east at 75 degrees west longitude and 137 degrees west longitude, this is the total coverage we get. And here's a map of the lightning uh, from low Earth orbit that we show with the coverage of the lightning mapper. This is before we launched. Here's a reference, a paper from 2013 on how we're gonna see lightning from geostationary orbit. So the US was first with the GLM instrument, but now we have others and we're trying to complete what we call the geo ring. So a geostationary ring of instruments uh, surrounding the planet. <coughs> Um, we launched the, the first GLM on GO-16 in uh, November uh, 2016. Um, the Chinese Meteorological Agency launched on their geostationary Fenyang 4A satellite, a lightning mapping imager with a more restrictive field of view that just covered China. It could rotate and cover Australia in the winter time, so they would still observe storms. And uh, Meteosat uh, has a new... Uh, series of geostationary satellites called Imaging Satellite 1. They also have a sounder satellite, and this is their lightning imager at zero degrees longitude. It has four telescopes, and I wanted to mention that when we first were looking at the design of a lightning mapper, one of the things that we needed to do was to do what's called a yaw flip maneuver, and what that is is the satellite's pointing in one direction, you flip it 100, and 80 degrees in order to reduce the sun load, sun bearing load on the satellite causes a lot of heating. So we had to design something that could be symmetric looking at the US. And so initially we had a design of two telescopes. That's sort of the design the Chinese followed. We also looked at one telescope and four telescopes. Four telescopes is what Europe has. And we finally settled on one telescope. In large part, the reason we ended up with one instead of two or four is because of the mass. And so concern early on, having never flown one of these, was that, oh, if we have four telescopes, it's gonna be very heavy. And uh, we wanna minimize the weight and we wanna minimize the power. So we went with one telescope. Okay, now I wanna switch in, towards the end here and talk about lightning for climate. So there's a value proposition for lightning. Lightning in 2016, because of having these operational satellites in geostationary orbit, uh, the World Meteorological Organization and its Global Climate Observing System, GCOS, had uh, declared that uh, lightning should be one of the essential climate variables. There's 54 of these, and it's a physical, chemical, or biological variable or link variables helping characterize the Earth's climate. These data sets provide the empirical evidence needed to understand and predict the evolution of climate guide mitigation and adaptation measures, assess risks, enable distribution, attribution of climate events to their underlying causes and underpin climate services. And there's a lot more interest these days 
uh, in climate, climate variability and change and whether that's natural or human induced and how much. And these are discussed at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so we've done a few reports on Lightning for Climate that you can see here at the right. We formed a task team in 2017. We're just now finishing that up. Um, and then there's a five-year implementation plan for 2022 to 27. Or what are we going to do with regards to lightning? And one of our main objectives is to stand up uh, stewardship through a landing page at the NASA DAC in Huntsville with ground-based and space-based data sets that people could then use for climatic research on thunderstorms and lightning. So lightning, again, being one of these essential climate variables. Yeah, I don't remember if I gave you that. Uh, no. Okay. Um, so here's those 16 and 17 showing you the flash density on left and the 2022 anomaly uh, versus the three-year mean 2019 to 2021. And so where did we see anomalies at that time? And that occurred during a three-year, what we call the triple dip La Nina that ended in March, 2023, and also COVID-19 with all the reduced industrial emissions uh, worldwide. And so see if you can remember the changes here before I show you what happens in El Nino which is what we have now. So here you see uh, a, a negative anomaly or fewer thunderstorms in the metropolitan part of the US and Central America. You got some enhancement here, the Southeast US, Gulf of Mexico, and then in the Sierra Madre, and then here in the Amazon basin, you see uh, less thunderstorms. So this implementation plan I just described, um, we're writing uh, papers for the state of the climate special issue of the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. We did 21, 22, and uh, we just submitted our, our summary for 2023, highlighting El Nino. Um, prior to that, we highlighted La Nina and also um, high latitude uh, lightning. And I'll show you a couple examples here. So here is the monthly trim uh, plus the International Space Station lightning flash rate. You'll notice there's no trend. You see the seasonal variations we had a break between 2015 and 2017 when the trim mission ended and the International Space Station mission in February 2017 began and then ended in November 2023. The LIS was replaced by another instrument uh, on the space station. And what's certainly of note here is this dip during the uh, COVID and the triple dip La Nina. So people were asking, you know, is this decrease in lightning activity worldwide occurring because of reduced number of aerosols and pollution that cause um, cloud condensation nuclei and those cloud condensation nuclei form raindrops. The raindrops get lifted into the upper reaches of storms where they freeze. And then you have a more efficient electrification process. Um, or uh, was it due to circulation patterns due to uh, La Nina and El Nino, we know that the circula circulation patterns change. So we look for a way in this latest paper in the bulletin of how can we combine all these different data sets and get a more of a uniform view. We decided to use what we call the thunder hour. Now the thunder hour is something an observer can hear again within about 15 kilometers distance from where they're standing outdoors. Um, from their weather station. And so if they have um, thunder heard during any given hour throughout the day, then they say, ah, oh, that's a thunder hour. The way we define that from remote sensing is we say we need to have at least two lightning flashes at a given grid point, less than 15 kilometers within an hour. And we can, we can do that from the ground-based and space-based systems. And then the mapping of thunder hours enable us to characterize thunderstorm frequencies around the world that can indicate high impact weather and the lightning hazard. So here's an example. This is El Nino 2023. Only through um, December, we didn't have the data, uh, December, January, February, which we will have, or we now have, but we haven't looked at that yet. Um, looking at the thunder hour anomaly in 2023 versus the prior five years. And what we find that's very interesting here on the left is one of these ground-based networks called the Worldwide Lightning Location Network, WOLAN, and then the uh, GLM, the Geostationary Lightning Mapper. 
over the same period, and we see a lot of similarities in these plots. So you've got this enhancement off the west coast of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru. The sea surface temperature is about two degrees warmer due to El Nino here. And you see an, uh, a maximum here as well in GLM. You see a maximum in southeast Brazil in both these data sets. Um, you see some of the enhancement that's out over the ocean uh, in the southeast US. Excuse me. And then you also see a lot of lightning up here in Canada, um, in Western and Northeastern Canada. And you may recall there were many fires in Canada then with a lot of the smoke uh, actually reaching uh, down into the United States. So I've heard that, yeah, lightning started these fires, but it wasn't necessarily that there's more lightning as indicated by this yellow color, but that the La Nina, it had been dry. And so the fuel, uh, decayed vegetation, dead vegetation was ripe for turning into a fire if you could ignite it. And that's what the lightning did. So my last thing I wanna show you is we can't observe the Arctic um, from geostationary orbit or even low Earth orbit, you know, 54 degrees latitude. But these ground-based networks have receivers around the world. <laughs> They're not uniformly spaced, but they can see into the Arctic. And here's something of great concern, and that is 2010 to 2014, you notice there's no lightning at the highest latitudes in the Arctic, 80 degrees north. And now we're seeing lightning uh, on the Asian side, <laughs> excuse me, the Arctic. Here's Greenland for reference. And then in 2021, again, um, we're having lightning in the Arctic. And the question then, is that due to sea ice uh, disappearing or is it and the warming or is it due to um, smoke, the fire smoke aerosols? We don't really know, but we know the sea ice is diminishing up in the Arctic. And so lightning is a, another indicator of, uh, of global change. Here's another plot. This one from a different uh, uh, commercial data provider. Vaisla has a network called um, Global Lightning um, Data 360 where they have receivers around the world. And they also have a plot here going to high latitude. So here is 65 degrees at the top, 70, 75, 80, 85 degrees. And notice until you get to 80 degrees latitude, you don't see this increasing trend in lightning. So we see it in two different day, independent data sets. And I wanna point out then, okay, if we're having issues in the high Arctic and we don't well sample Alaska now, what might we do in the future? I wanna point out Alaska's here at about 150 degrees longitude, 61 degrees latitude is, um, I think that's Fairbanks. And so you see there is lightning up here at higher latitudes. And the next generation lightning mapper, which uh, is in a source evaluation board, decision should be made hopefully soon and what this next generation instrument will look like. It'll fly in 2032. Again, the plan is to fly and goes east and goes west. And you see we have expanded coverage up to high latitude um, with a decreasing um, uh, pixel area, but still able to detect lightning at these highest latitudes. And the coverage, as you, you can see there, will have um, faster sampling, uh, smaller pixels, which will give us a higher detection efficiency and, and the greater area of coverage. So we're looking forward to the next generation lightning mapper on the GeoExo program, geostationary and extended observations. So here we are in summary, and here's one of these long flashes. So now you should all understand how did we get to one of these and what's going on in the leading front line of the lightning activity and then how did this lightning get back here to what we call the trailing stratiform area. So in summary, lightning is a global natural hazard of great significance with hundreds of millions of flashes worldwide per year. This new generation instrument or next generation instrument is an evolutionary advancement over GLM. It's still gonna look at the 777 nanometer spectral line because that's a strong uh, emission uh, line for lightning. Um, with climate change, we're asking these questions here about how is the lightning essential climate variable related to other variables such as clouds, precipitation, atmospheric composition, nitrous oxide, which is another 
central climate variables, surface observations such as surface temperature, severe weather reports, uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the Madden Julian Oscillation, and upper level humidity, just as an example. And then we also want to raise lightning safety awareness, and we're collaborating with the World Health Organization and the uh, World Meteorological Organization Disaster Risk Reduction Natural Hazards Program on uh, addressing public safety going forward. So some resources, some websites you can look at, and then we have a book about the Gozar series. This is a link to it, it's on Amazon. Um, we talk about all the instruments on the platform, including the lightning mapper. And thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Goodman, for the very informative and wonderful presentation about history of lightning measurements and their relevance. Uh, so this brings us uh, to the close of today's session. Uh, here's a note about homework. As I mentioned earlier, there will be one homework assignment. Uh, it will be posted on the last day of the webinar on 2nd of April and uh, it will be available through our set training webpage. Um, answers must be submitted via Google Forms and the homework due date is 17th April. Certificate of completion will be provided to those who attend all three live webinars. Uh, please note that attendance uh, is recorded automatically. And those who complete the homework assignment by the deadline, you will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after completion of the course. Here's the contact information uh, for Dr. Goodman and also you can contact us uh, for any additional information. Uh, here's the RSET website. Um, follow us on Twitter. Uh, there's also RSET YouTube where you can uh, access our past trainings. We have our sister capacity building programs, Develop and Surveyor. The websites are provided here. And so thank you for attending uh, today's uh, session. And next we will have a question and answer session. Everyone, so we have our questions um, listed and Dr. Goodman will help us answer uh, the questions. Um, so let me, so please keep typing your uh, questions in the question uh, in the chat box. Um, so here we have the first question. It says, can we detect how intense lightning will strike on Earth's surface for future prediction? Can you hear me? This is Steve. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, detect lightning on the Earth's surface for future prediction. So. There actually are now numerical weather prediction models that have parameterizations for lightning. Uh, we have some at NOAA um, for the regional model and their next generation regional model, which is the RFFS, the regional forecast system, actually has this parameterization in it. And uh, it can do a good job at times of predicting lightning in the next 24 hours. Um, the lightning forecast is only as good as the model, however. <clears throat> and so it's based on, um, the, as I talked about early on, the development of the updraft and, and precipitation particles and ice aloft that is efficient for electrification and also the updraft intensity. So we couple those two parameters and we have a couple papers on using that parameterization. And if there's in the spring and the fall, when you have strong baroclinic zones, you get frontal systems, it does pretty well. But in the summertime, say in July, Northern hemisphere, these air mass storms, the numerical models just do not do a very good job uh, predicting the uh, development and evolution of storms. So again, um, you can only do as well as, uh, as the model can, but actually next week, there's gonna be a meeting about lightning modeling that uh, folks are going to talk about how can we uh, improve the current state of the art. So it's a good question. Um, we're making progress. Um, when you talk about intense lightning, there's another aspect called continuing current. 
And it's believed that that's what starts the forest fires. And so right now there is some initial ideas or algorithms to identify continuing current from any other kind of lightning. And this would be the duration of the lightning flash. And we're hoping um, that that can also be improved and we could determine from space with some good probability that a particular lightning detected is either in cloud or cloud to ground, and also that it may likely have continuing current. And that's what sets the fuel on fire. So we're making we're making progress in that. And I think that's what I have for question one. Thank you, um, Dr. Goodman. Yes, that's um... it may be a long answer for number two. Uh, what variables can cause lightning? And that would be obviously um, atmospheric instability. So clouds can form uh, the deeper and taller the storm, the more lightning it will typically have. So an unstable environment with plenty of moisture and gradients of, of the, uh, the moisture and instability are good for forming thunderstorms. And so that would be what would um, be the source for making lightning or not. Over the ocean, the updrafts typically are much weaker. In fact, even in tropical cyclones, you know, you know there's high winds, but those winds tend to be horizontal. There's not much typically in the vertical of the development of those thunderstorms around the eye wall of the hurricane or tropical cyclone. So it, we need that vertical development in order to have lightning. Um, also over the oceans, because the the storms charge slowly when you do get a discharge, the lightning tends to be more energetic than the typical lightning over land. Sometimes I would say 25% more energetic. And so that's something uh, we continue to look at. And with the new satellite from Europe, the Mediasat third generation lightning imager, they're gonna be able to observe the Mediterranean Sea. And it turns out the Mediterranean Sea in the winter time has a preponderance of these very energetic uh, lightning flashes. Uh, the question about hydrology, I put a brief answer in the chat. Um, the main application there is in mountainous terrain. So for the US that applies to the intermountain west, um, the complex terrain or the high terrain blocks the radar beam from seeing low levels um, at at sometimes short, but certainly at long and medium distance, and the lightning's not affected by that. So where you have gaps in the data from the radar, the lightning can help fill that. And if you have uh, lots of lightning, frequent lightning, you can see that um, that storm is, you know, more likely to be a uh, rain producer or a heavy rain producer. And the National Weather Service forecast office out in Phoenix, for example, uses the lightning to fill some of those gaps in the radar. So question four is, there is an understandable emphasis on low latency solution for detecting right. lightning. Yes, yeah, so all, all of these data sets, whether from space, we have a 20 second latency to get the data to the user, the, the ground-based data has even a shorter uh, latency, and they have very high spatial accuracy um, where they've got a dense network of receivers. Um, so they they all get the data out in within a minute or less um, to the users. So that's, uh, I would say, very good, uh, you know, near real time data availability. Uh, monitoring upward lightning, it's interesting. Um, the ground-based systems and even the space-based, when there's a lightning discharge from a highly electrified uh, region, say around a, not just a building or tower, but even uh, wind turbines. Um, I don't have a figure in this talk to show you, but uh, in the wintertime uh, in the Northeast US uh, near the Great Lakes, they get lots of wintertime uh, lightning flashes uh, many dozens from a particular storm, and those cause quite a bit of damage. There's a report from Europe from one of the wind turbine uh, operators that over 170 million uh, euros in damage 
uh, annually from uh, from lightning striking a turbine, of course, that takes it down. So one of the future forecast applications would be if these models, numerical weather models, can predict with uh, reasonable certainty that, hey, there's going to be a high likelihood of lightning in this area over this time period, then the turbine operators, for example, or even uh, repair crews going out to repair power lines or power outages, you know, can have a heads up and be more responsive uh, in those situations. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Goodman. Um, we have a few minutes left. If you have any more questions, please um, type in the chat box and uh, we can address them now. Um, also, uh, just wanted to remind you that our next session is going to be day after tomorrow on 28th, Thursday, same time. And um, that will focus more on um, different missions and sensors and then how to access lightning data. So there's one more question. Is there a way to discriminate cloud to cloud from cloud to ground lightning with GLM? All right, I just typed an answer. There, there's a paper that based on her PhD work, Jacqueline Ringhausen from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. I don't recall which date, it's just in the last couple of years. And she used 20 criteria and a random forest uh, decision uh, model. So it would be like the energy of the lightning, its location, its horizontal extent, um, its duration and so forth um, as attributes to try and discriminate what does an in-cloud versus cloud to ground lightning look like? And she had about a 70% success rate. So there are there's an initial method and it can be improved upon before we went to space, we looked at statistics of the lightning. As I told you early on, you have this cloud to ground strike that you saw in that one picture, but it's the light inside the cloud that makes its way to cloud top that we see. And it turns out that's all we had from our U2 uh, measurements in the 1980s. And the problem is that an in-cloud flash, um, or a, sorry, a cloud to ground flash, can have a longer duration and have extensive horizontal extent, even though it strikes the ground. If it strikes the ground, we call it a cloud to ground flash, but that's what confuses an algorithm just solely looking at how many pulses did we see from a flash and what is its extent. So her paper looks at other attributes of the lightning and is having more success. And that would be uh, good work for a master's or PhD student to continue looking at. Let's see about definitive location of a ground strike. So we don't have the spatial resolution from our space instrument, which is nominally around uh, eight kilometers. In the future, the instrument will be still more like six kilometers at nadir. So we won't have the same spatial accuracy these ground-based commercial uh, networks have to locate the cloud to ground strikes. When we conceived of the lightning mapper in space, we really were targeting that, that image I showed you of the rapid increase of the total lightning related to the kinematics and development of severe storms, as opposed to um, say a, a fire uh, or a fire that would start from the initial strike <clears throat> to the ground, which was how these ground-based systems began in the 1970s um, in the US, the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service uh, deployed these so they could find where fires might be starting in remote areas. And now what we have is we have <clears throat> the multi-channel uh, imager on the satellite that can detect fire hotspots. And we have the lightning mapper and there are people doing studies now trying to see if you can combine those two pieces of information to better identify where a fire might be ignited. I don't know of any evidence. I think it's a myth that mobile phones are attracting uh, lightning. 
Um, the towers that the signal goes through, you know, are sticking up pretty high and those obviously get hit um, by lightning. And uh, while you're thinking about mobile phones, think about being in your car. Uh, don't ever stand under a, a stand of trees. That's very dangerous. Lightning will hit the trees of the ground and the ground current will spread out and get people who are, say, tens of, of uh, meters from the source where it strikes the ground. You're better off in your car if you got a car. And then your, um, your metal uh, car will uh, conduct the lightning through the tires to the ground. And uh, question nine on coal mining is a good one. Uh, there's a famous or famous or infamous uh, coal fire um, that was started by uh, lightning. I think it was in West Virginia in the United States. And it was just that there was a storm there and I don't know how well grounded uh, the wiring is in a coal mine, but the lightning struck the ground and got coupled into the coal mine and it started a fire. And I know there were people killed from that. I forget the name of the coal mine, but uh, you can look that up. So I have a question. Uh, would uh, like mining area have um, aer effect on aerosols that might have some influence on storms and lightning? Well, uh, I, I've heard I've heard that methane may have an impact mm. on. Uh, you know, the formation of clouds and aerosols and such and methane you're going to get where you've got fracking and and oil wells. Um, how the aerosols from those types of things, what they what their main role is, is they form what we call cloud condensation nuclei or CCN. Mm -hmm. And you need something for a raindrop to form around, whether it's a dust particle or an aerosol particle of another type. And then you take that raindrop you take an updraft, you lift it up above the freezing level, zero degrees centigrade, and then up there it's gonna freeze. And then you'll have ice particles interacting with each other and that's how you transfer charge and eventually, eventually build up enough charge to have a lightning discharge. So that's the role. And I, I should say that this question about aerosols and lightning has been around for decades. And it's still not resolved what the role is of the aerosols and in, in uh, forming lightning. That's why I said during the COVID-19, the reduced industrial emissions, people thought, oh, well, that must be why we had that dip in the lightning that you saw mm -hmm. in the lightning imaging sensor time series. But it could just as easily or, or it could be coupled with the fact that circulation patterns also changed. So maybe the storms weren't as vigorous, or maybe they were somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's because a very complex problem, and I think that's why the WMO is very interested, as are we, in what is the relationship and interaction between lightning and all these other parameters. And until you have the observation, you can't look at it very well, and so that's what we're doing now. And I should point out, having total lightning is important, because if all you had is just the cloud-to-ground lightning, you've only got a piece of the story. So having the in-cloud and cloud-to-ground together, which is our plan for the WMO uh, Global Climate Observing System database that people can access freely, um, allows you to look at all the lightning and you can someday with a new algorithm discriminate, yeah, this is likely in-cloud, this is likely crowded-to-ground, and, you know, and do additional studies. But that's pretty much where we are with the state of the science. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Goodman, for that. And I saw your note. If you have any follow up questions, you know, you can send any of us an email. We'll try to answer it. And there's one more question. Is there light, lightning data for any regions. Um, there's lightning data for all regions, I should say. You know, these three ground based. Um, low frequency lightning networks will be part of our climate data set. And those will be available at least on a monthly basis. 
Um, it may be the thunder day in some, I mean, yeah, in some cases it may be a thunder hour. In some cases, it'll be a, uh, a gridded density map uh, globally that's 0 0.1 by 0 0.1 degrees uh, per grid on, on the order of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. So now we've got the GLM lightning instrument, which is the Western hemisphere since uh, 2017. And uh, we will continue that with our new constellation into the 2050s. The METSAT just launched their first lightning mapper. They'll continue that for 25 or 30 years. China has plans to continue developing lightning mappers with even broader coverage, not just the China mainland and the North China Sea and flipping it over into an Australia, but they may they may go to multiple telescopes and be able to see a much broader region or say over to India. And the ground-based networks, um, yeah, cover regional data. And the, the issue one would have with say um, the high frequency networks, which are short baselines and typically provide national coverage those data sets are not necessarily available to the public. So the, the big step forward by the WMO that we're helping with is to make a public data set available to any of you interested in lightning, thunderstorms, extreme, extreme weather, and you know how what's the inter, interaction between these different variables. And hopefully that data set will start becoming available at the end of the year. That's that's wonderful. That's great. Thank you. Oh, so question ten is thunder speed affected by drift velocity, and if so, does the uh, capacitance of the cloud have uh, proportionality with its volume, and so the strength of the lightning? Is it what you meant when you showed us light speed um, as general velocity and its relation to volume or did I misunderstand? Yeah, I was talking about getting the information out for a public warning. Um, if you're talking about drift velocity or the distance between particles in a cloud, um, the there's so many particles there that uh, the lightning can initiate what we call a, a streamer off of corona on a cloud particle. And it'll propagate to where there's still a disturbed, um, you know, electrical or a charge in the cloud. So if you have a strong updraft and you've got more charge there, yeah, you're going to generate uh, more sources for lightning to uh, initiate and then propagate. Like at the very first slide you saw with the the hundreds of kilometer long lightning that propagated. In the in the leading edge of the storm system, and then back into the trailing, what we call the stratiform rain region. You know, if that doesn't answer the question, you know, we can follow up later. Thank you, uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, we're almost uh, at the end of our session today. Um, we want to thank our guest instructor, Dr. Steve Goodman, and um, it, this was really very informative and in depth about um, all the history and what's currently going on and what's going to happen in the future with lightning measurements. So, really appreciate your time and help with this information. Um, and want to thank everyone for attending this session as well. Uh, we hope to see you on Thursday, the day after tomorrow, on 28th at the same time. Um, so, questions that uh, we cannot answer right now, we will answer them and post them on our website, on the training website. And one last question I see is, one source described the step ladder as invisible. Is that so? Once try the step meter. No, no, it's not invisible, but obviously it's, it's a lot easier to see from a nearby ground-based uh, radio frequency uh, system or electric field change measuring system. But it's not invisible. We do, we can see light if it's bright enough. They tend to be weaker than what we call the return stroke, which is mm -hmm. 
after you've got a ionized channel and the lightning goes to the ground and then returns back to the cloud, what we call the return stroke, uh, those tend to be a much, much brighter. The brighter it is, the better we'll see it from space. Thank you very much, Dr. Goodman, for today's seminar. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending to the, today's session as well. We hope to see you on Thursday. Yeah, thank you all. Also want to thank our RSET team for helping uh, coordinate these sessions. Um, we have uh, Selvin Hudson Otoy and uh, Natasha um, uh, for helping uh, setting up everything. Sarah Karshal, Jonathan O'Brien, Brock Levins, and our other team members uh, have helped. So thank you, our set team. Great job, everyone.